All right, guys, welcome back to Lesson 47. Here we are digging into the Word of God, Exodus 34 and 35. You know, uh, not a whole lot's changed since we talked yesterday. And what I mean by that is, is the Israelites still had messed up. They, they, they went to their own uh, means of worshiping a golden calf. Moses comes down. He gets all mad. He slams down uh, the Ten Commandments. And then they begin to have this dialogue about God. You know, first of all, he brings a plague, and then he makes the Levites kill 3,000 guys. And it's a lot of drama. And the crazy thing is God says, oh, by the way, I'm not going to go with you anymore. And so he takes Moses, the tent, he moves him outside of the camp. And that's the context that we're in. The context is, is now the Lord begins to speak to Moses about the next steps. So in Exodus 34, verse 1, the Lord says to Moses, cut two stone tablets like the first one. And I will write on the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Moses, I saw you. I saw you smash them. I saw you break them. And now, well, now we got to do it all over again. And so he says, be prepared by morning. In other words, tomorrow's going to be a new day. I want you to be refreshed. I want you to, to purify yourself. I want you to cleanse yourself. I want you to get ready because you're going to come up to Mount Sinai in the morning and stand before me on the mountaintop. Now, you guys, we, we've done some trips before where we don't always know the length of time. Sometimes it's turned into a one week or two weeks. You know, sometimes it's even turned into seven weeks. But can you imagine, you're coming up before the Lord uh, and for 40 days. We know that in Exodus 34, verse 28, Kevin, if you'd go there, we know that for, for 40 days, Moses was there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, I'm just going to tell you now, we'll talk about it on the back end, but he didn't eat bread or drink water. And so you wonder, here you are in verse 2, man, I sure hope he was prepared. <laughs> I mean, not, not just like, oh yeah, I got my, my tablets, but no, more, more than that, like mentally, physically, emotionally. When you come before the Lord, and I love this image of in the morning, it's kind of like the one commentator says, the forces of darkness are gone in the morning. It's like the nighttime picture is out and God is going to bring his mercies are new every day, every single morning. And it has this imagery of even in Genesis 19, you know, Abraham wakes up early, in the morning. In Judges 6, here we have this, this, can you go there, Kevin? Judges 6, 28. Here we have Gideon, Judges 6, 28. You know, in the morning, uh, when the men of the city got up in the morning, they found Baal's altar torn down, the Asherah pole beside it cut down, and the second bull offered up on the altar that had been built. In other words, the evil destruction was gone overnight, and in the morning, it was like a new, it was a new day, and I love this image of the morning. Luke 24, verse 1. It's a powerful picture Luke 24, verse 1, Scripture says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb bringing the spices they had prepared. What you're going to see, and honestly for me, and I, I'm not there. I'd like to be there. I'm getting there, but I want to be that man of God. I encourage you as the men and women of God, like, where are you at with your time with the Lord waking up early? And I love this because it says in verse 2, by, Be prepared by morning. Come up by come up Mount Sinai in the morning and stand before me on the mountain type, top. And so, you know, this is for Tom because Tom wakes up at the crack of dawn to exercise. This is really the first time you're going to see exercising in the morning and also spending time with the Lord. Now, Tom, i got to ask, do, do, you, do you read Scripture when you're working out or are you just like... No. <laughs> <laughs> There's not a whole lot of us standing before the Lord. It's just coming up Mount Sinai right now. Uh, the drive of my car to the gym is about 15 minutes, so that's kind of my quiet time in the morning. That's good. All right. Well, I love this image of, of, of Moses getting ready to meet the Lord. And make sure you purify yourself. Make sure you get ready. Kevin, can you go to Job 1, verse 5? Job 1, verse 5. Again, it just has this, this image of, uh, this is really cool. Watch this. Um, whenever... Whenever a round of banqueting was over, Job would send for his children and purifying them, rising early in the morning to offer burnt offerings for all of them. For Job thought, perhaps my children have sinned, having cursed in God in their hearts. This was Job's regular practice. Isn't that cool? How in the morning he would get his kids ready. He would present them to the Lord. He would get ready. He would present himself to the Lord. And I think sometimes when you come into work or you go to school or you're with your kids or you're, you're getting ready to, you know, whatever, have a meeting, whatever it is, the challenge is this, like the holy priests were to come into the tabernacle, they were to actually spend time with the Lord before in the, in the day and at the end of the day. And that's really what's happening in verse 2, be prepared. And so in verse 3 of Exodus 34, the scripture says, no one may go up with you. Moses, you're on your own on this one. In fact, no one must be seen anywhere on the mountain. Don't bring Joshua this time. I know he likes to hang out in the tent, but don't bring him with you. 
even the flocks and the herds. They're not to graze in front of that mountain. What is going to take place? You can't have anybody near. And then in verse four, <laughs> it says Moses cut two stone tablets like the first ones. Okay, God, I'm going to do this. So you can just imagine this dialogue. He got up early in the morning. He's obedient and taking the two stone tablets in his hand, hand. I think that's interesting. Doesn't, I don't know. For me, when I read something like that, is, is he carrying them both in one hand? Are they not that heavy to me? I would think they'd be super heavy. But Mine he says hands. Huh? Says Yours says hands? Mm -hmm. So either way, he's carrying these two stone tablets, and then he climbed Mount Sinai. So if he has to climb any tough stuff, I mean, he's in good shape. Just as the Lord, he has to be. You know how many times he's been climbing Mount Sinai? And so it just says, just as the Lord commanded him. Now watch it says in verse 5, the Lord came down in a cloud. You guys, right away, you should think of the pillar of the cloud of day. Look over here in, in our deliverer theme, okay? Constantly the Lord shows up how he's going to deliver his people through a cloud over and over. And so it's just a cool image about how that deliverer then obviously points to the Messiah. And we know that the Messiah is the one who ultimately delivered his people out of Egypt. So the Lord comes down in a cloud. And just that imagery, you guys, it makes me think of John 1.14. When it says that the Word became flesh, He dwelt with us. And this Emmanuel, God with us, you have a picture very simply of, uh, of the Lord coming down to the cloud. So Kevin, if you can go back for me in verse 5. The Lord came down in a cloud, stood with Him there, and proclaimed His name Yahweh. He, he just tells Moses, hey, Moses, my name's Yahweh. I'd be like, yeah, I, I got that figured out, God. Because like, I mean, the presence of God, you think you would feel, you think you would sense all that God is is doing. Strangely enough, this is described as, and I don't know if I'm going to, if I'm going to get this right, you guys. It's an epiphany. I think I said that right. It, it, what that means is it's an appearance of the Lord, okay, in a grand ascent to encounter humans. So the Lord shows up in a crazy, ridiculous, fun way in order to connect with humans. I mean, very similar to what we saw all throughout Exodus as the Lord continued to lead the way. If you would, Kevin, go to verse 6. And this is what the Lord said. He said, the Lord passed in front of him. Okay, him would be Moses. And he proclaimed Yahweh. So he's describing himself. Don't, I love this image. It's the attributes of God. Yahweh is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and rich in faithful love and truth. It continues on in verse 7. And, and lists, like, I feel like this is an incredible laundry list of who God is. He's maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving wrongdoing, rebellion, and sin. But he will not leave the guilty unpunished. And bringing the consequences of the father's wrongdoing on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Now this language of who Yahweh is, this language of the attributes of God, Moses says it again to those at Kadesh Barnea in Numbers 14, but not just in Kadesh Barnea, but the Jews, they use the same language. And and I'd love to encourage you guys to dig more into this. In, in Nehemiah 9, 17, and 18, again, the, the, the Jews describe exactly what Moses just said. In the classic one, you know, Jonah. Jonah is the one who, who doesn't want the Ninevites to have to see and experience the Lord. He, he just doesn't like them. In fact, he didn't want to go there the first time. But in Jonah 4, 1, it says, But Jonah was greatly displeased, and he became furious. And in verse 2, he prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why I fled Tarshish in the first place. I know you, God. I knew that you're a merciful and compassionate God, slow to become anger, rich in faithful love, and the one who relents from sending disaster. I, I know, God, that you have, one commentator says, you've got a long fuse. You're not really here to, to hammer us, and we understand that in, in the men of God continually are describing the attributes of God. God is willing to show his mercy, but he also reveals, hey, it's, my wrath comes as well. And Moses knows that. And so in verse 8, he says this. It says, Moses immediately bowed down to the ground and worshiped. Immediately, when he hears how God describes himself, his immediate uh, reaction is submission. It's not to argue. It's not to say anything in response. It's literally to bow down to the ground and worship. And then in that moment in verse 9 of Exodus 34, he said, My Lord, if I indeed have found favor in your sight, my Lord, please go with us, even though this is a stiff necked people. 
Forgive our wrongdoing and sin and accept us as your own possession. You know, he's still praying for a reversal because at this point right now, Yahweh is still saying, I'm not going to go with them. Right now, he says, I'm not going to go with you into that land. I'll send the angel, but my presence is not going with you. And Moses, again, he intercedes on behalf of his people. He intercedes that God would relent and change his mind. It makes me think of Ezra in Ezra 9 or Daniel in Daniel 9, when both of them, they cry out to the Lord on behalf of of the people. Think about Nehemiah, even Nehemiah. He says, <laughs> memory starts crying out to the Lord, Lord, please spare my people. Forgive us of our sins. And that's exactly what Moses is doing. Moses doesn't separate himself from the people. He makes himself a part of the people. And I got to tell you, just in the church world, you know, we've been traveling the United States for 10 years. Any leader that disassociates himself with the people, I'd be really careful. I'd be really cautious of you know, there's a, there's a whole thing called humility. There's a whole thing called servant. And to me, when a leader begins more and more to pull themselves away because they think they're more special than somebody else, I would probably press in and say, why? And what I love is, is Moses isn't doing that. Jesus doesn't do that. Moses presses in and says, please spare your people. And then God responds in verse 10. So the Lord responded, look, I, I remember, they're still at Mount Sinai. There's a lot of interaction. The cloud is dropped. I'm making a covenant. All right, I, I hear you, Moses. I'll perform wonders in the presence of all your people that have never been done in all of the earth or any nation. And all the people that you live among with will see the Lord's work. For what I am doing with you is awe-inspiring. Or one commentator said, it's an awesome thing. God says, I'm with you. I'm going to make a covenant. Moses, I hear exactly what you're saying. And in verse 11, observe what I command you today. I'm going to drive out before you the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And so now what you're going to see is that God is going to restore the covenant, but he's going to put some things in place. In fact, Hamilton says he's going to give you divine guidelines for the Israelites on how to live faithfully. Because right now, they haven't shown a whole lot of encouragement. And so what we're going to do is I'm just going to give you two simple points. But if you would, go to uh, Exodus 34, verse 12. And the first thing that he really says to his people, he says to Moses, he says, don't make a covenant. And this is so obvious, but he has to say, don't you guys feel like all we do is repeat things? <laughs> I wonder what God felt like. Like, I've said this five times. <laughs> but by the way, don't make a covenant with the Canaanites. And so this is what he says to his people in verse 12. Be careful not to make a treaty with the inhabitants of the land that you're going to enter. Otherwise, they will become a snare among you. In verse 13, instead, instead of making treaties, here's what you got to do. You got to tear down their altars, smash their sacred pillars and chop down their Asherah poles. In other words, in order for, as Warren Wearsby says, in order for healing to take place, in order for them to experience a healthy lifestyle, you have to remove things. And God says, I want you to remove all of this stuff. I want you to get rid of it because these things, these religions, they're not of me. Because the second you begin to relate to these people, uh, the more you open up yourself to turning away from the Lord. And in verse 14, you're never to bow down to another God because Yahweh, being jealous by nature, is a jealous God. God, do not make a treaty with the inhabitants of the land or else when they prostitute themselves with their gods and sacrifice to their gods, they will invite you and you will eat their sacrifices. You know, this is crazy, but this is, this is exactly what happened with the golden calf, you guys. And the golden calf, if you would, Kevin, go to Exodus 32, verse 5 and 6. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. Then he made an announcement. There will be a festival to the Lord tomorrow. And I watch in verse 6. Early in the morning they arose, offered burnt offerings, and presented fellowship offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink, and then they got up. Go to verse 19, if you would. As he approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, watch, that's when you know Moses became enraged and threw the tablets out of his hands, smashing them at the base of the mountain. What happens is, is that in, in this land, they go back to their old lifestyle. They go back to the ways of the world. And he says, please don't do this because then in verse 16, then, then you will take some of the daughter of their daughters as brides for your sons. Their daughters will prostitute themselves with their gods and cause your sons to prostitute themselves with their gods. 
Nelson said it, the quickest way to compromise is to integrate yourselves with other false religions. And that's exactly what happened. This isn't a racist comment. This is literally a protection of their people so that they don't fall into the ways of the world. So one, the Lord says, okay, fine, Moses, I'm going to be with you. Okay, I'm making a covenant with you, but make sure they don't make a covenant with the Canaanites. And then the second component, <laughs> I love how obvious God is. He says, I want you to worship me. I want you to worship God. So in verse 17, don't make cast images of God's for yourselves. And so what he does is he begins to say, how do you do this? It's, it's really pretty cool, you guys. He begins, and we've studied this. A lot of you have already seen this. But he says, I want you to observe the festival of unleavened bread. So the way that you worship me, the way that you focus on me is you celebrate that what I'm, what I'm doing. He says, you're to eat unleavened bread for seven days at the appointed time in the month of Abib, Abib, as I commanded you, for you came out of Egypt in the month of Abib. And then he begins to describe the festival, okay? Now, I want to keep going. In verse 21, you're to labor six days, but you must rest on the seventh day. You must even rest during plowing and harvesting times. And even when it gets crazy, you guys, you remember, we talked about the Sabbath, and I think this is really cool. We talked about Sabbath is a form of celebration. So I want you to celebrate all that I've done by being a part of the festival of unleavened bread. Celebrate me on the seventh day and rest. And then he says in verse 22, observe the festival of weeks with the first fruits of the wheat harvest. And then he says, and then I want you to celebrate the festival of the ingathering. So really what he's saying is, is, and then it continues on in verse 23, three times a year, I want you to celebrate this. And then, uh, and then the Sabbath is every seventh day. And the way that you worship God, and I love this, is that you celebrate who he is. So don't make a covenant with the, covenant, the Canaanites. And then also at the same time, I want you to celebrate me and remember what I've done. This sounds really obvious, but I'm telling you, when the nations continue to go back to the false way of doing things, they need markers in their life when to look to the Lord. It says in verse 24, don't worry, I will drive out the nations before you and enlarge your territory. Nobody will covet your land when you go to the, up three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. So when you come to celebrate me, you know, it, it, uh, as you come together, your land will be okay. It is okay. You don't have anything to worry about when you celebrate me. Now watch this in verse 25. He says, don't present the blood for my sacrifice with anything unleavened. The sacrifices, uh, the sacrifice of the Passover festival must not remain until the morning. We've talked a whole lot about Passover, haven't we? Over here, when you have the, uh, the blood of the unblemished lamb with the hyssop, and then you paint it on the doorpost, then all of a sudden things are going to be passed over. He, I want you to celebrate what I did in Passover. Bring your first fruits. Okay, that's how the Lord says, I'm with you. I'm with you, but please don't make a covenant, and I want you to worship me. What drives me nuts about some of these chapters in Exodus, and I don't know if it's with you guys as well, it feels like a bunch of staccato sometimes. You're like, he's over here, and now he's here, and oh, by the way, I'm going to throw in something here, and now we're going to go here. They all on a bigger picture point to uh, really Jesus being the deliverer of the Israelites. But in order to be a deliverer, God sets parameters for the people to understand who he is. And really, the book of Exodus is a whole lot of parameters. And it seems exhausting because when you function in a period of grace and you function in, in, in Christ working in your life, you're not used to all these rules and regulations. But in order to understand that freedom that we have, we have to understand where we came from. So it says in verse 27 of Exodus 34, Moses, the Lord says to Moses, I want you to write everything that I've told you to do. Write down these words, for I've made a covenant with you and with Israel based on these words. So based on all of these words, not making a covenant with the Canaanites, worship in me and celebrate through unleavened bread, the festival, through Sabbath every seventh day, the, the festival of the weeks, festival of ingathering, and then the, the Passover. By the way, I'm making a covenant with you based on this. The Mosaic covenant is taking place. And I want you to write it all down. Just so you can see in Exodus 17, 14, Kevin, if you'll go there, Moses is told constantly, what I'm telling you, I need you to write this down. And then the Lord said to Moses, write this down on a scroll as a reminder and recite it to Joshua. I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. Moses, I need you to write this down. This is important. Exodus 24, verse 4. Why? Because we have a bad memory. 
And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord and he rose up early the next morning. He set up an altar. And again, the point is, is that Moses is writing these things down. And in fact, in verse 28, Moses was there, it says, with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did not eat bread or drink water. He wrote the Ten Commandments, the words of the covenant on the tablets. What's weird to me is this is not the same feel as the first time the Lord wrote this. The finger of God wrote the last one. And now it says Moses wrote, wrote down the Ten Commandments. And there's a quote here by um, Casuto, and I, I really like this, and I can't connect with it, but I understand it. It says that when somebody's been divorced and then they remarry, that, that second wedding is nothing like the original first. It's lost its excitement. It's lost its festivity. Not as people come to the festival, not as lot as people come to the wedding. It's, it's kind of the same feel. Moses, just write this down and let's implement this. And so that's exactly what Moses does. He writes these things down. And then in verse 29, as Moses descended from Mount Sinai, this is the best, you guys, with two tablets of the testimony in his hands, there it says hands, as he descended on the mountain, he did not realize if I'm just going to jump in here before we read this, he did not realize that the skin of his face shone as a result of his speaking with the Lord. He didn't understand that when he was with the Lord, like you could see the presence of God in his life. He didn't realize that he was, his face was shining so bright. And so in verse 30, it says, When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, remember, they weren't even close by. The skin of his face shone. They were afraid to come near him. And this is crazy, you guys. I heard once uh, a friend of mine, Jay Kessler, he used to be the president of Youth for Christ and the president of Taylor University. He was a friend of, uh, and he's he still, I don't know how much interaction he has still today with Billy Graham, but Jay was telling me a story that when Billy uh, went out to restaurants, there were times where you would literally just see him glowing. He said, I know that sounds crazy. He said, but when people spend that much time with the Lord, there's a different countenance. There's a different presence that you sense about him. And man, I hope someday that I spend so much time with the Lord that people just, in walking, they sense the presence of God in my life. And that's exactly what happened to Aaron uh, and the Israelites when they saw Moses. You know, it makes me think of the Mount of Transfiguration. Remember when they're seeing, uh, it says at, at, at some point that Jesus was dazzling white. And so in verse 31, Moses called out to him, and so Aaron and all the leaders of the community, they returned to him and Moses spoke to them. Now watch this. Afterward, all the Israelites, they came near and they commanded them to do everything the Lord had told him on Mount Sinai. All right, did you catch this? Everything that Moses had written down. Don't make a covenant. I need you to worship the Lord. I need you to do the Ten Commandments. It says everything, he commanded them everything the Lord had told them to do. I wonder how long that conversation was. And I wonder, how, how does he do this? How does he gather millions of people? How does he gather everybody together? He has no sound system. And he just tells them, man, this is what I heard from the Lord. And then in verse 33, when Moses, Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. You know, I was talking to my little son Jude at night. I was talking him into bed and I was like, Jude, what's your favorite superhero that wears a mask? And he's like, well... I like Batman. Batman's pretty cool. Batman wears a mask. Is there any other superheroes? That just What's the first one that comes to your mind that wears a mask? I think Flash. Flash? Iron Man? He wears, he's covered completely. Um, and like, I've never viewed... Spider-Man. <laughs> Spider-Man? I've never viewed Moses as a superhero. And I've never viewed him as wearing a mask. But the reality is, you guys, He's putting a mask over his face. I mean, we, we think of veil, we think of wedding, but he's completely covering his face. But whenever in verse 34, Moses went before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And after he came out, he would tell the Israelites what he had been commanded. This is a cool, crazy interaction. And then the Israelites would see that Moses' face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went to speak with the Lord. I'm going to try to make this as plain as you can. The veil is off when he's standing in the presence of the Lord. When he's done, he puts his mask on. <laughs> uh, that Moses would put on his mask, put on the veil. He'd come talk to the people. He would tell them what he heard. And then every time he was done talking, he would go back on up to see with the Lord, Mount Sinai. He'd go be with the Lord. He'd lift his veil off. He'd have an encounter. Then he'd go back. 
I love what the scripture says about all of this. That sounds almost tiring, doesn't it? Like, hey, here it is. Go back. Here it is. And I want to go to 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7 and on. The Apostle Paul actually addresses this exact interaction. Now, if the ministry of death chiseled in letters on stones, did, did you see that? He equates the ministry of death with what? The Ten Commandments. He says, now, if those Ten Commandments came with glory so that the Israelites were not able to look directly at Moses' face. Remember, right? He was shining so bright he had to have a veil. But look what it says. They weren't able to look directly at Moses' face because of the glory from his face. But look what the Apostle Paul says about the superhero Moses wearing a mask. He says that glory is fading. Now go to verse 8, if you would. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Why is it fading? Because he was constantly away from the presence of the Lord. And so he couldn't interact with the people. You know what he had to do? He had to go get back filled up with the glory of God. He had to put himself in a place where he would shine like God, come back down, and then he'd be veiled. And that veil, that fading, that glory would fade. He didn't want the people, Moses didn't want the people to see his glory was fading, so he'd have to go back up. Like to me, that's an ongoing trying to earn, trying to show, trying to earn, trying to show. Like ah, that's exhausting to me. And the Apostle Paul, he's not knocking Moses. He's just saying that glory in the Old Testament, it's fading. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? And in verse 9, Paul continues on in 2 Corinthians, for the ministry, if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness overflows with even more glory. Glory continues on in verse 10. In fact, what had been glorious is not glorious now by comparison because of the glory, the glory that surpasses it. Man, that's awesome. Verse 11, it continues on. For if what was fading away was glorious, what endures will be even more glorious. Verse 12, therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness. Verse 13 and on. We are not like Moses who used to put a veil over his face so that the Israelites could not perceive the culmination of what was transitory, but it continues on in verse 14, but their minds were closed. For to this day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains. It's not lifted because it, ha it is set aside only in Christ. Verse 15, even to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. It continues on, but when a person turns to the Lord, are you ready for this? The veil is removed. Folks, the veil is gone when we turn to our Lord Jesus Christ. That's where the glory is. The glory is now in the Messiah, Jesus Christ. We don't have to go back and forth, back and forth. The glory never leaves when you're in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is a fun one, isn't it? Second Corinthians, Paul talks all about that and how that points to the Messiah. All right, guys, uh, it's been a pleasure. Lesson 47, Exodus 34 and 35, and we'll do it again tomorrow. Thanks.